Okay, so I think uh, we will uh, listen to the second lecture of Francois on a fine manifold and group manifolds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Um, I'd like to start with a reminder slash update. If you remember from uh, the end of yesterday's lecture, there was this picture with a, a uh, triangle with the vertices outside H2 and then a slightly smaller triangle. And I said something about a map from one to the other. So what, what I was saying was, uh, if you take the big triangle, bounded by lines LL prime, L double prime, and map it homothetically, uh, homothetically in that particular chart to the smaller triangle, uh, then this map extends um, in an equivariant way. And what I forgot to say uh, yesterday was the word equivariant. So that's, that was a potential source of confusion. So it extends um, equivariantly with respect to the groups generated by reflections in sigma L, uh, reflections in L, L prime, L double prime. So sigma means reflection. Action on, of that group and of the other group, sigma lowercase l, l prime, l double prime, uh, equivariantly. Um, to a map f from h2 to h2. So the first group acts on the source H2, and the, the second group acts on the, on the other H2. And that map is contracting. So mind you, uh, we, mean, we mean contracting um, uh, for the metric on H2. So the, the, this homotety is contracting by a certain factor. But uh, it's, uh, it's not a uniform factor if you look at it in the, in the hyperbolic metric. In fact, points close to the boundary here will be mapped to points close to a new slightly smaller conic down here and contraction there will be in fact by a huge factor. So I, I formulated this yesterday in a slightly different way where in fact in, instead of two triangles in one conic I had one triangle in two conics. This is just a different way of saying the same thing and in fact it's not completely a waste of time to have the both formulations because Later on in the in the Coxta group examples, there, there will be both things varying at the same time. The, the domain, the, the, the simplex here, will be changing over time and the conic will be changing also. But what we care about really is how the distance changes, how the, the distances between two points in the simplex is measured with respect to the uh, Hilbert metric in the conic. So that was the, the reminder. And again, the the reason we care about equivariant contracting maps was this theorem one that we had uh, that said if you have a map f from h, let's say hn, I think yesterday we were, I was calling this x but let's not fool ourselves what we care about is uh, the hyperbolic space uh, to itself that's equivariant with respect to two actions uh, J of gamma and rho of gamma, equivariant contracting. Then uh, you can always write, let's see, the isometric group of Hn, which is our Lie group G. Um, you can map it, project it to Hn in an equivariant way. So the action here is on the left and right by J and rho of gamma. And the action there was by uh, J of gamma. 
So the action at the target being properly discontinuous. Um, so this uh, projection is given by, if you take an element J, its image is just a fixed point of G inverse F. So the statement of this theorem is that this is well defined. And the reason we care a lot about such projections is that uh, proper discontinuity pulls back uh, always. So what does proper discontinuity mean? Is, is that if you have a compact set, then it's pushed away from itself by all but finitely many elements. So let's say we have a compact set here. Uh, push it forward, it's still compact. Here you have proper discontinuity, so it's pushed away, and then you can pull back. So therefore, proper discontinuity lifts. And you have a proper action in J uh, rho of gamma on G is proper. So again, the action here is that gamma dot G equals rho of gamma G J of gamma inverse. So that was theorem one yesterday. And I, I gave one variant of this theorem yesterday, uh, and somebody uh, um, made me uh, realize I had forgotten to state what the projection was in, in, the, in the, the infinitesimal variant that I stated yesterday. So let me do this quickly uh, also. Theorem 2. Similarly, Um, if you have a vector field instead of a, a map, uh, a vector field on the on HN that is uh, contracting and U J equivariant. then um, uh, the isometries of HN are replaced by infinitesimal isometries. That's called the killing fields of HN, which is also the Lie algebra. Um, you have the, the affine action by JU here. is going to project down to the same space, Hn, with the same action, j of gamma. So let's still call this projection pi. Uh, and the way this projection is defined is that if I have an element, so a, a, a killing field y, I send it to, so what's a fixed point? The analog of a fixed point for, for vector fields is, is just a zero. So here I have the zero of uh, minus y plus v. So minus y plus v is strictly the analog of g inverse circle f. Right? f was a map, and v is an infinitesimal map. That's a vector field. Uh, well defined. Then properness lifts. So uh, we have an affine uh, manifold U J of gamma acting on G. The quotient is, a, is an affine manifold. Affine well, or orbifold, I should say. So here what I had uh, omitted to, to uh, describe was the, the definition of the projection here. 
so the, the next variant of this uh, same statement that I want to give is a kind of coarse, um, so that's now new, a new statement, coarse version. Um, first, I, uh, let me point out, we can say a little bit more about these um, projections. We can describe their fibers. Because what's the fiber here? The fiber here is... Um, the fiber is above a point of Hn. I have all the isometries G, such that G, G inverse F fixes that point. In other words, all the isometries that send that point x to f of x, so the, 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 that's a copy, uh, a, a two-side coset of S O N. Right? Fiber is a copy of the group S O N multiplied on, on the two sides by something. Um, similarly, here, fibers are affine transformations of uh, the. Lie algebra S O N. Uh, now, in the in the third course version, the, the assumptions will be slightly weaker, but the the, the the payoff is that we we won't be able to say much about the the fibers of those projections, so not much about the the quotient. Uh, so here's the the new version. Let's suppose G is the isometry group of x, and in fact, what I will care about is the isometry group of h, p, q minus 1, like in Olivier's talk. Um, so that's s, o, p, q. And suppose um, j of gamma inside of g acts properly discontinuously on a certain subset, so on some uh, non-empty subset of X. Possibly not all of X, no, not all of X. So that's, uh, that's weaker than the, the properness assumption we had here. The well, suppose um, V is a UJ equivariant um, vector field on X prime. So again, the vector field doesn't have to be uh, defined everywhere. Uh, and it's uh, coarsely contracting in the sense that the distance, um, the, the, the derived distance, d prime, according to the vector field v, between two points, p and q, uh, is at most c times d of p, q. Uh, plus a constant where c is negative, and what what I mean by the by the the distance between p and q is h p q is the inside of some uh, quadric in in uh, p p plus q uh, r. I should actually say p of r uh, p. Q and yeah, the space is H Q minus one, H P Q minus one, and when you have two points in there, you can measure their pseudo distance, so to speak, by 
Again, it's a quadric, so you draw the line uh, through the two points. It, in, it intersects the quadric in two points, and you compute the cross ratio. So, like yesterday, uh, the D. Let me let me draw a little twiddle over the D to remember that it's not a, actually a distance. D twiddle of PQ is half the log of the cross ratio uh, A P Q. B. So A is here, B is there, and the cross ratio is computed in the convention where A goes to zero. So you, you find a, a Möbius transformation of this uh, of this projective line that sends A to zero, P to one, B to infinity, and Q to a certain number, and that's your cross cross ratio. Okay, so uh, going back to the statement, if you have such a, a, uh, a vector field, then um, the action, the affine action on the Lie algebra given by u and j, where u was the co-cycle, um, is uh, proper, properly discontinuous. Uh, so as before, u, well, u, you can you can do u j as a representation valued in the semi-direct product of G by its, uh, by its uh, Lie algebra, which is also the tangent group to G. Right? Oh, I, I overstepped the, uh, there's, a, there's a boundary somewhere on the, on the right. Was it this line? Does someone remember? There is no line anymore. OK, so I should stop here at most. Yep. It says it's, a, it's not a distance in the sense that it does not satisfy a triangle inequality. But it will do for us. What we mostly will need is that it's equivariant with respect to everything and that it goes to infinity at infinity, in some sense. Uh, so there's D and there's D prime, right? There was D that measures distances, and D prime sub V measures how the distances vary under, under the vector field. Uh, uh, v. So basically, the, the picture is that if you have P and Q, uh, if they are very far away, then this will be very negative, right? So saying that the D prime is very negative tells you that, that the, the vectors point towards each other, at least measured along the segment PQ. And that's all it means. And you can, uh, you can take this tangent vector uh, Project it perpendicularly to the to the segment PQ. You measure its coordinate, subtract it from the coordinate longitudinal coordinate of the other vector, and, and that's a number. And that's D prime. It does not. Uh, the, uh, uh, the D prime does not have to be positive. If two points move towards each other, D prime is negative. If they move apart, it's positive. And even the D twiddle here is, uh, since it's not actually a distance, it, 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 uh, it's, it's a distance as long as you, as you measure it inside a, a space-like subspace, right? If you, if you take a slice here that looks like a copy of H2, then the D twiddle on that slice restricts to a, 
something isometric to the hyperbolic plane. But if you tilt your plane, then it does funny things. The point is that uh, in the examples we are going to uh, uh, use, the, um, the distance will go to infinity. I mean, th things will only accumulate sort of horizontally. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wrote it on the blackboard yesterday what d prime is, so let me just write it again. d prime, by definition, d prime, according to a vector field of two points, is you take the distance between the two points and you differentiate it with, uh, according to, the, to the, the flow of the vector field. So distance between exponential at p of t uh, v of p and exponential at q of t v of q. So that was defined uh, yesterday. Uh, okay, the, the idea of proof of this theorem three is again a projection argument. So I need to, to, to express what the uh, projection will be. Uh, so instead of projecting to x or x prime, we'll be uh, more modest and just take uh, the, let's see, let O, be a subset of x prime uh, that's I guess I just need um, gamma invariant and co-compact for example just take one orbit you may have reason to take something more more sophisticated but take just one orbit of a point uh, in the region where gamma acts properly discontinuously. And then the projection will go from G, uh, the, the Lie algebra, with its affine action, down to, so I cannot take X prime, I, I, I don't want to take O, let's take the finite subsets of O um, and the way this is defined is that you map a killing field Y to the collection of um, the collection of points that minimize, so, so it's like this, uh, this, uh, this zero property of uh, contracting kinetic fields. So you don't necessarily have a zero, but you have some, some points that minimize the norm, minus x plus v of O. Uh, so here the the action is just a j of gamma as usual um, so well defined the, the, this map is well defined equivariant and you see in the in the infinitesimal statement here we had a contracting vector field V to which we add a, a killing vector field, so that's still contracting. And these vector fields have the property that 
Well, if you, if you look at them on a large enough ball of Hn, they will be inward pointing. Right? The, the, you have the vector at, at your base point that's maybe non-zero, but, but uh, a, a fixed amount. And the, the, the vector field V is supposed to be contracting. So if you look at, and all the more contracting that you look at, look at distant points, so if you look at the boundary of a large ball, it has to go towards the, the center because they have to move at least proportionally uh, towards each other at, at a rate proportional to their distance. So such a vector field that's inward pointing on a ball has a fixed point property, that's Brouwer's theorem, and you can uh, conclude here. Now, in our in our new setting, there's only one. There's only a. We're no longer working on a on a on a uh, manifold, a copy of HN, we'll have just one orbit, one, one space O. So there's no, um, uh, there's no fixed point theorem on, on, a, on a thing like this, but we can still look, at, uh, look for the part that minimizes, and that, that would be enough. So uh, I'd like to show some more applications of, of theorem Two and then three. So, yes, yes. So it turns out. I mean, it's it's mostly just one point, and sometimes there will be a competition. But due to co-compactness co and uh, and equivariance, nothing really goes to. Uh, an equivariance is some some sort of long symbol pushing. Uh, check that you have to make, but it is equivariant, I guarantee it. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you just bound it on, on a compact fundamental domain. So, as an application of two, I'd like to uh, show the following. There exist pro properly discontinuous actions of surface groups Uh, by affine transformations on uh, R, so pi 1 of S G, that's a surface, on R uh, 3 plus 3. So there's a copy of R6, and in fact, for us, it will just be the Lie algebra of S O 3 1. So, uh, proof by two, it is enough to find a, uh, a family of contracting maps. So, it is enough to find. Um, J, U, and I want to think of this as genuine deformations, so just J0 and then the, the path JT, a path of, of representations, um, but we only care about its class to first order, representations Uh, of gamma in, so gamma is the fundamental group of the surface, in SO31. And FT, F sub T, uh, from H3 to H3, 
equivariant with respect to the, the actions of J0 and JT. Uh, and being 1 plus CT Lipschitz with uh, F0 being the identity. Then apply theorem 2 to the vector field uh, V equal to the, the differential of the collection of maps Ft. Right, so you, you deform H3 in a way that sort of tracks the deformation of the, of the action, and you want this to happen in a, in a contracting way. Um, so in order to, in, in order to, to provide this path of, uh, of uh, representations JT and maps FT, I need to talk a little bit about quasi-Fuchsian groups. So there are in fact very good reasons why you, you cannot do this with, with J0 being a Fuchsian representation, fixing a copy of, of H2. So that's the reason we have to move up to SO3 one. So what do we need to know about quasi-Fuchsian groups? Well, Fuchsian groups are representations uh, that go into SO21, subgroup of SO31. So they fix a copy of the isometry group of H2. And the picture is that they, they fix a round circle they push. There's a fundamental domain somewhere in that, in that disk, and uh, the limit set is the round circle. Quasi-Fuchsian means, or, or for us, let's say it means uh, it's a small enough deformation of Fuchsian. And when you take such a small deformation, you have a limit set that will be a uh, Jordan curve. Limit set uh, is a, so usually a fractal curve, but still a Jordan curve. So it looks very squiggly. But it's injective. Looks something like, something like this. Um, and when you have this uh, limit set, you can compute its convex hull. Of lambda. So it's the convex hull in H3 of a collection of points that are at infinity in H3. So uh, the, the way in, in, with this, in which this makes sense is you draw all the lines connecting a point of that curve at infinity to another one. It's a very complicated set, and then take the convex hull of that inside H3. Or oh, yet another way to talk, to talk about it is that you, uh, you look at everything inside the projective model for H3, the Klein model, and then you take the convex hull in the sense of, of straight lines in the in projective space. So this will have generically two uh, so-called bending laminations. In fact, uh, C modulo the action of gamma will be homeomorphic to S cross 0, 1, the interval. Um, but it's bent. It, it has a, there, there's some amount of bending happening at the top and at the bottom. But the, there are no extremal points inside H3. The only extremal points are, are ideal points at infinity, points of the, of the limit curve. 
So you have to think of a, of a convex set without any extremal points in three dimensions. That's really just a surface. I mean, its, its boundary is going to be a surface bent along some lines. Um, boundary is bent along two Okay, let me use the word geodesic laminations. But for us, it's just collections of lines. Uh, closed, um, projecting down to, the, to S. Now, I claim, and it's not particularly hard to, to, uh, to uh, come up with examples, I claim that there exist, for example, quasi fuchsian groups that have the top bent along just one simple closed curve and the bottom bent along another simple closed curve. And automatically, these two curves together fill the surface. So property... There exists a representation J quasi Fuchsian such that uh, the top boundary of C is bent along one or only one. Simple closed curve uh, let's call it gamma top and uh, same for the bottom boundary bottom of C the two curves together gamma top union gamma bottom fill the surface that's automatic and it means the uh, you cannot find any other simple closed curve in their complement any simple closed curve has to intersect either one or the other so that's that's not the typical situation because usually if you take a random deformation then the bending will occur about some sort of fractal set but you can think of these fractal sets as limits of very long uh, simple uh, simple closed curves and it, it's not that different to do a little bit of analysis to to extend. So um, let's take such a J and then I want to describe something called wedge deletion and probably a picture is, is best to, to explain what that means. So here's the, the top boundary of S uh, I'm just going to draw it locally, so I don't have to say if this is in the quotient or in, in H3. The boundary is bent along uh, gamma top. So it looks something like that. And what I want to do is insert a kind of wedge. Let's change colors. A wedge in here. Along, it's sort of like a knife edge that follows the, the bending curve. So, what you do is delete this. And uh, the, the wedge exits the, the bottom curve, the, the bottom surface. So, sort of. Uh, without crashing through itself. So to achieve this, you have to take a quasi-Fuchsian representation that's not too far away from Fuchsian. You just assume that the top and bottom uh, boundaries are close to each other. So you delete this, you do this equivariantly, and the result is, and you delete and glue back. So the result is you have something that, that's more bent than it used to be. Right? Um, 
and it's equivalent with respect to a new deformed uh, action. So the 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 angle here was t, and the new action is uh, well the new representation is j prime. Well, J sub t, it's, it's, not, it's not quite the J t I want, so let, let me call it J prime t for the moment. So the, um, the new convex core, C t, comes for free with a map from the old one, C0. Um, the natural map, collapsing map, C0 to CT uh, is one Lipschitz. Uh, in fact, it makes every, every curve shorter than it was except one. Right? Uh, so, sorry, it makes every curve shorter as long as that curve intersects gamma top. Um, so, uh, collapsing map F. T, so let's call this f prime t also. Uh, f prime t contracts every loop, uh, every geodesic loop, unless it intersects. Uh, I mean, uh, unless it is it is disjoint. From gamma t. In S, so the disjointness is meant not not in the in the three-dimensional sense, but whenever you have two curves, you can look at them as topological, you know, curves in uh, in in the surface S and ask if they intersect or if they don't intersect. And if you have a curve that 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 intersects gamma top, it has to go through one copy of this wedge somewhere, and it cannot go through it at the at the uh, in the. Um, uh, up here, where the wedge has width uh, has thickness zero, right? Because if it, the, the geodesic loop has to has to live inside the convex core. So if if it uh, if it goes through a point of gamma top, it has to be gamma top. And it always crosses the the wedge somewhere uh, uh, below gamma top, and therefore when the, when the wedge gets collapsed, the, the the length shortens a little bit. Uh, so. To, in order to uh, shorten all the loops, just remember that gamma top and gamma bottom were filling the, the whole surface, so you repeat with gamma bottom, and then all the loops have lengths that go down. So yeah, the, the the bottom of the convex hull will not glue up to itself in a clean way. You just get a new representation. It has a completely new convex core. You have to recompute the bottom of the convex core. It looks different. But the point is that the lengths go down. Now, uh, when I say so, that this is why it's cheating a little bit because as soon, uh, if I want to repeat with uh, with uh, with gamma bottom, gamma bottom has changed once I recompute the convex core. Well, it doesn't matter. Do it with the new one. Or if you only care about the infinitesimal situation, which which is what we do, we care about the um, only the class of JT uh, to first order. Then you just do it infinitesimally for the top and add it. Then, then there's an additiveness of of uh, vector fields and the co-cycles. Just add uh, and take the the linear combination of the two. So repeat. With uh, gamma bottom, and um, now the lengths. Now, uh, length of J T of gamma of any gamma over length of J of gamma is bounded away from one. Uh, and in fact, there is a T 
theorem that if, if you have such a bound on, uh, on, uh, on the length ratios, then you can uh, actually find a Lipschitz uh, map that is uh, also contracting. So let's then, then use a Lipschitz extension theorem. Uh, theorem. So I, I won't be talking about the proof of this unless you're interested. But it says um, if uh, it works in HN, in HN, um, if the number L equal to the supremum over all loops of the length ratio, length of j prime of gamma over length of j of gamma, um, if that number is less than one, then k defined as the supremum uh, of Lipschitz constants of maps from um, HN to HN that are equivalent with respect to the two representations. Premium uh, is also less than one. I mean, clearly, k has to be uh, at least as big as L, but it's still less than one. It's at least as big as L because when you when you uh, have a how does this go? If you have this length ratio. You compute, you, you you integrate the the differential of f along a loop, and and you get that the, that the Lipschitz constant cannot be better than the, the length ratio. It has to be some amount of stretch by a factor l. Um, and complementarily, in fact, if l is bigger than one. And then k is also bigger than one, but in fact it's equal. And that's something pointed out by Thurston. So the, the, in other words, Lipschitz, the Lipschitz condition behaves well with respect to, to uh, length ratios. And so once you've shown that all the lengths go down, you can find a contracting map. Okay. Now, this is not the, 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 the easiest way to provide examples of uh, contracting families of quasi-Fuchsian representations. But what's nice about it is you could do more explicit, more symmetric things, but essentially this shows you could start with almost any quasi-Fuchsian group. Any quasi-Fuchsian group that's close enough to Fuchsian, you'll be able to do this. Uh, provided you, well, maybe you have to do wedge deletion on, a, on an irrational lamination. So you have to generalize this construction a little bit, but it's not, it's not really different. OK. Um, so the next thing I want to do is talk about how much time is there left. I want to talk about Coxter groups. So, uh, Coxeter groups oh. by definition, a Coxeter group is a group generated by involutions. So, S one through Sn, subject to relations that say uh, Si, Sj to some power Mij 
equals one for all ij, where uh, m i i equals one. In other words, each SI is an involution. And um, m i j is at least two uh, and possibly infinity. Infinity just means there's no, uh, just to remove that relation. You, know, you could also say, say it's zero. Okay, that's what uh, Cox the group is. And um, right angled by definition means that uh, all the MIJ, all the MIJs are either two or uh, infinity. And uh, there's a natural notion of irreducibleness. So irreducible by definition means uh, one N is not a disjoint union Uh, of non-empty subsets such that um, m i j equals zero for all i j in i cross j. Uh, if it's reducible, then it's in fact a Cartesian product of two subgroups that commute with each other, and uh, irreducible is if not. So that, that's checked readily on the on the matrix of the MIJs. Um, okay, and what I in case you've never you've never seen such uh, or worked with such groups, what I want you to um, uh, take away from this uh, lecture is that they always want to act on a certain pseudo Euclidean. Vector, uh, uh, vector space, a real pseudo-Euclidean vector space. So instead of giving the the, uh, the definition, let me treat an example first. A remark. Write it here. Gamma acts naturally on a certain pseudo Euclidean R P Q. And the way this is done is, uh, for example, Let's look at the two, three, seven triangle group. Two, three, seven triangle group. So that means M <coughs> one, two equals two, M one, three equals three, and M one, seven equals seven. Now, <coughs> uh, I claim that this acts on H2, the projectivized R21. Sorry? That's supposed to be 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, sorry. Uh, I claim that this, this acts on, on uh, R21, so, so bear with me. I'm not saying yet why PQ equals 2, 1, but in other words, Uh, there exists a triangle in H2, in H2, with angles pi over 2, pi over 3, pi over 7. 
So this is not very hard to believe if you know the, the condition on, on angles in a, in a hyperbolic triangle. But let's imagine we wanted to compute actually where the vertices of such a triangle lie. So it has a, an angle pi over 2, so let, let's put that at the center. And our triangle will, be, will look something like this. Right? This is a right angle. We want pi over 3 here and pi over 7 there. And pi over 7 there. That's the, the base triangle. And then the group acts by reflections in, the, in its sides. So if you repeat, if you, if you compose reflection in the, that side and the, the, the adjacent side, pi, an angle pi over 7 again, you get a rotation by an angle 2 pi over 7. And that rotates. And then the, the, there are very beautiful tilings of H2 that you can find on, on the internet by this triangle. But again, if we wanted to compute the actual coordinates uh, of the, these vertices, we would be we would write down some distances and square roots and angles. But one more streamlined of streamlined way of doing this is to not look for lines inside a given uh, ellipsoid like here, but instead give yourself the reflecting walls and look for the ellipsoid that has the correct, uh, I mean, <coughs> for which the angles will be as given. So, uh, idea for, for, uh, for uh, writing down its uh, vertices. Let's just say that <coughs> the three sides, uh, L1, L2, L3, will be dual to um, vectors, E3, E2, and E1. Right, the, the lines are perpendicular to the basis vectors of R, R3, but perpendicular with respect to a bilinear form that we are about to write down. So uh, E1, E2, E3 basis of R3, and uh, Li equals Ei perp, with respect to with respect to what? So I, I want these um, these vectors to be space-like in if you remember the familiar picture. Here's the hyperbolic plane, and the when you have a vector, e, you have its perpendicular subspace. It looks something like E perp. So we want the vectors EI to be a uh, unit norm with respect to the to the, the quadratic form. And we want the uh, so the angle between EI perp and uh, EJ perp the cosine of this angle is in general just uh, minus the scalar product of EI EJ when these are unit norm and this is easy to to uh, see if you take just e i e j to be in the horizontal in the horizontal plane here of r two one and then then uh, you have the vector e and uh, and its perpendicular plane is perpendicular to it in the usual sense it's just vertical it contains the vertical line and then you measure the it's the same thing to measure the angle between the two vectors or between their two perpendicular planes 
So in other words, here we should have cosine, cosine uh, pi over 2, cosine pi over 3, uh, I'm sorry, there's a minus here, minus, minus cosine pi over 7, and it's symmetric. Uh, minus cosine pi over 7. And you see that this matrix is essentially the matrix of the Mij's, except I wrote minus cosine, every, uh, or minus cosine pi over everywhere. So... Easy to write down. M I J. And the um, I can always write down this matrix. And the fact that it's H two coming out as, as opposed to another R P Q is just a consequence of the signature of this matrix, right? If I have the M I Js, I can write down the matrix. When there's an infinity. When one of the Mij's is infinite, that means that some of the walls of this fundamental triangle or polyhedron, polyhedron or whatever miss each other. And then I uh, what I should write here is the distance between the two walls. So I get to choose a number, how far away the, the, the walls would be. If they do meet, I have to say what the angle is. If they don't meet, there's a degree of freedom there. Um, and again, this, the signature. In general, this is called the Carton matrix. Uh, so let's call it C. And in general, the C, the signature of C will determine P and Q. And what you do next is just reflect when you you, you, you In general, signature of C determines PQ. And uh, uh, gamma, the, the initial uh, Coxter group, is the group generated by reflections in the walls uh, uh, e i perp but perp is now with respect to the to the notion the, the bilinear notion c so everything is completely encapsulated in the in the in the Cartan matrix, and you can in fact convince yourself that if you wanted to do it the other way around, fix the fix the bilinear form and look for the look for the correct edges here, that would more or less correspond to inverting this matrix. So that's the reason why it's it's easier to do in this direction. Okay, so theorem by Winberg. In the, uh, I guess, well, it's roughly the year 75. Um, if gamma is an irreducible Coxter group, then gamma acts properly discontinuously. not on all of HPQ, of its corresponding HPQ, but on a convex, or it's, it's called properly convex, so that means convex and looks bounded in some chart, properly convex um, subset, sigma, uh, of the negative cone, H P uh, Q minus one. Yes. 
of S O C, right? The, the orthogonal group of uh, of the Carton Berliner form. So I should okay. I should be honest here and say I cheated a tiny bit. There's something weird happening when the uh, when you get to adjust all the all the all of the um, all of the uh, entries for Mij infinite. There's something weird happening if the um, if the rank of the matrix uh, becomes non-maximal, and then then you cannot no longer work with the with a basis EI. And there, there's a whole theory of, of uh, deformations of Hoxha groups in that context. However, in the in the examples we care about, uh, that will not happen at all. We will always work with the standard standard basis, and so the, this will be essentially reflections in the faces of some simplex. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, Okay, and moreover, I, I should say what sigma is. Sigma is just the um, intersection of delta and delta perp, where delta is, is the positive orthant. In the in the in the basis EI. It's a very natural uh, object to to define, and unfortunately, it's hard to to make pictures except for very small Coxler groups. But uh, you can trust the intuition coming from um, the three generator group given, given as follows. Example uh, M. I j well m one two equals m two three equals m three one equals infinity. That means I have three reflection walls. One two three and they should not meet. Uh, so this is e one perp, e two perp, e three perp, and such lines have a have a uh, have common perpendiculars and our uh, well the, these two hyper ideal triangles are in fact the projectivized delta and the and its projectivized uh, dual so here is sigma right and in fact this shows that in this case, uh, gamma sigma uh, is just the convex core. Okay, and so what else could I say? These lengths here, uh, consistent ways of naming them would be L2. L three, L one. Uh, they show up in the in the Carton matrix. C equals one one one. And here there's minus cosh uh, L uh, whatever L two minus cosh L one minus cosh L. Sorry, this is a three two and extended symmetrically. That's your matrix. You get you get to adjust those uh, lengths and then that will deform your, your simplex over here. Um, okay. Oh, and by the way, if you want to write down the, the uh, ith generator, Note the matrix of SI, the ith generator, is just um, the identity minus twice the ith 
line of C, right? If you if you go through everything I've done, you have a completely explicit pre uh, presentation of uh, of gamma as a matrix group. Okay, so the theorem I wanted to talk about is the following. It's an application of the of the course uh, theorem three from the beginning of the lecture. Theorem, so that's in joint work with Danziger and Fanny Cassel. Um, under the same assumptions, you have um, an action of gamma acts properly discontinuously. On, um, I should say, the Lie algebra of SOPQ. So it's the same uh, the same group we had before by affine transformations. The um, the cycle U or U J uh, that so that's the deformation of, uh, of J of gamma in tangent space of SOPQ. Corresponding to to uh, the family of Carton matrices So how can we deform them? Well, remember I said for everywhere where you have a point, uh, have, you have an entry that's infinite, uh, an Mij that's infinite, you get to choose the entry in the in the Carton matrix. So in fact, what you do is everywhere you have, where you have a choice, you put um, uh, well <laughs> C. Uh, Constant minus t times minus t times uh, c variable. So that that's just a. I don't know how to say this simply, but some of the, some of the entries are fixed. They are equal to cosines of things. Some of the entries are zero. That's when mij is zero. Uh, sorry, when mij is is uh, two. When when two uh, generators commute. And some of the entries get to vary, and you just make them all equal to t. Um, well, I should say minus 2 plus t in that, in that presentation, right? So m, uh, sorry, c, i, c, t, sub ij equals minus 2 cos, so it's equal to 1 if i equals j, minus 2 cos uh, pi over mij if mij is finite, and uh, minus 2 plus t otherwise. Um, well, I, I was a little bit careless. I should say a some, some constant, some capital T, some negative constant, and you you deform on. Um, all right. Is there like how how much time time is there? 
it's time to stop. Well, uh, that's a good place to stop. You can you can sort of pull uh, put everything together now because you have the uh, you have the fundamental domain. You have a way of deforming the 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 negative cone. Um, and as I described at the beginning of the lecture, you can you can measure how the distances go, uh, how the distances evolve um, under the deformation. So that's kind of a computation. I don't think I will go into the computation uh, next time, but essentially, you apply theorem three from the from the beginning of the lecture, and everything is set up for for this to work. Thank you. Are there some questions? Okay, so, and then thank Francois again, and um, we resume at, I don't know, this afternoon, three o'clock, thanks. <laughs>